Welcome back to the Weekly Hell YouTube channel. I'm your host, Owen, and today we're going to be going through, and this is going to be more of a biased video, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to make any of these for the rest of the teams before the draft comes out, but this is the team that is closest to my heart and that I know the best. Uh, so this is going to be kind of more of a one-team show, so sorry for anybody else who watches me and isn't a fan of the Buffalo Bills, but I'm going to be going over uh, different tiers of prospects I think the Bills should target in this draft class. Now, there's going to be... 21 different players I'm going to cover today, and I know that the Bills don't obviously have that many picks to pick all these guys, but I'm just going to touch on each guy, give my little piece on why I think the Bills should take them, and they're each in a different category that I've placed them in, that being day three flyers, day two to fill holes, first round gamble, and a first round home run. So we're just going to go through and talk about each of these guys, why I think the Bills should take them, where I expect them to take, or where I have them graded to go. Uh, and maybe uh, where they're expected to go is a little different than where I have them graded. But we will just discuss that uh, all together here. So let's just dive right into it since we got a lot of ground to cover. First up is our category of Day 3 Flyers. The first player we're going to talk about today is going to be Charlie Jones, the wide receiver out of Purdue. Uh, was a mix of like a downfield threat as well as like more of like their short area burst kind of guy. He's not known for like elite speed, but he did run a good time and showed some good of that, some of that good uh, downfield speed. At Purdue, ran a 4-4-3. Uh, he's not very good through contact, and I think he's going to have to transition more to the slot because despite him having some good footwork and stuff out of his break or out of his um, stance there, he gets jammed up a little bit because his hands are a little too activate, late to activate. And he just isn't a fan of contact whatsoever throughout his routes. Like It just kind of disrupts him a little bit, makes him a little slower. Um, he's not very good at changing direction to try to avoid contact. He's really... Good at straight line and maybe doing some routes coming back towards the line of scrimmage, some slants, some shorter stuff like that. So he's going to be like that typical fifth receiver, maybe backup slot guy. Um, phenomenal hands. So the reason I think he's going to be a slot is he has phenomenal hands. Like probably, he's, I think he's consensus best hands in the draft. I've seen like a lot of people just pick him as best hands. As well as I think he has a really good IQ for where to like stop and start in the zones, how to work off his quarterback when he's scrambling and things like that. So a decent Decent traits for a guy you want to be like a depth receiver who can contribute. You throw him out there, and you're not going to be afraid he's going to have a crucial drop or something. You're not going to want to rely on him to be like a volume receiver. But you get some injuries, you get banged up, or you just need to guy, give a guy a breather and have him run around, and if you need to toss the ball to him, he's going to come down with it. I think that's a pretty solid option for Charlie Jones. I wouldn't expect him to be like this great contested catch guy. No, he's not like a, he's not a small slot Uh in any way, shape, or form. He's not like one of the smaller guys in his draft class. He is. He does stand at 5'11", 175. But he doesn't really play above the rim. doesn't really have that like leaping ability. But he, he does really have really good hands, even when in contested situations. So despite not being able to go up for jump balls, if you, he has contact around him, he's still able to make those catches through the traffic. Uh, it's just more of his route running and speed that takes a hit when he is faced with contact. So I think Charlie Jones would fit as like a kind of a low ceiling, safe, Backup wide receiver option, maybe as a returner um, who can just catch it and maybe use some straight line speed to get down there. Uh, like I said, good concentration with his hands and good good straight line speed. Probably a return guy, special teamer, as well as someone who can contribute out of the slot when so if like maybe Kalisha Gear doesn't develop enough or if the guy you pick to start there in the beginning of the season needs a breather on a player or two. So that is my case for Charlie Jones, wide receiver Purdue, who I currently have a fifth round grade on. Next up, and sticking with wide receiver, we're going to go Tyler Scott, the wide receiver out of Cincinnati. I had a full video breakdown of his skill set and everything I have seen on him with, uh, on tape. Next up is going to be wide receiver from Cincinnati, Tyler Scott, sticking with that position. And I think Scott's going to be more of a projected, like, maybe third receiver or developmental second receiver, uh, where I think he has a good skill set when it comes to being a receiver athletically. Size-wise, he's 5'11", 185, so around that kind of stuff on Diggs' height. And wait, he's good as a, a route runner. He's got good downfield, actually great downfield speed. So he ran a 4 4 4 40. It's not like amazing, but he's got good downfield speed. He's good um, routes while in full speed. And I think he's just overall a well rounded receiver. However, what's keeping him being a fourth round prospect for me is that the fact that his hands are atrocious. And you need to just kind of work him. You need to draft him, work him over and over again. Maybe this guy is going to fall to being a UDFA because he got drafted like fifth overall. In the USFL draft, so maybe they're gonna wait to see if he can like be worked up a little more in that league first. I'm not sure, but just purely off of everything outside of his hands, he's a pretty good talent. And if he was able to just get his hands down and down pat and confirm that he can catch balls without losing it, it doesn't matter if it's a contested catch, concentrated, 
digging it out deep, going up high. He has drops everywhere on his tape. Uh, I think he'd be like a third round guy, maybe even pushing second round if he could just get those hands down. For right now, he's a fourth round flyer with a glaring flaw. And if you can fix that, I think you'll get a good guy who can maybe take over as your number two or number three when Gabe Davis or whoever leaves later on in the next few seasons. Sticking with the fifth round, with switching up position, we're going to go to Zach Harrison, the edge of Ohio State. Fifth round guy here. I've been on Zach Harrison for a while. Uh, he was not my guy for the longest time because people like Matt Miller and other draft analysts had him as like a threat to be the top five edge rusher in a class since like 2020. I think what those guys saw was his five-star pedigree as a recruit and more and more opportunities to play at Ohio State and thought that they predicted him to grow more as a pass rusher and that just never really happened. He is a bigger dude, standing at 6'6", 270. Uh, that's what he was listed at at Ohio State. I'm not sure if they got a better measurement. Let's double check. 6'5 and a half, 274 as we went into the combine there. Uh, but yeah, he's a bigger guy, good athlete for his size. It was just he never developed those pass rush techniques throughout his time at Ohio State. He was always a solid to good one defender. And I think that's what he's going to be immediately at the NFL level is he's going to come in and be that kind of big body guy, set the edge on the play side. Can get off blocks in the run game, but just never able to really put it all together to be like a high end pass rusher and affect the passer. Uh, he could fill your Shaq Lawson role, or you draft him to eventually take over and allow Boogie Basham and or AJ Epinesa to walk and not have to pay those guys. So I think this could be a good investment for them, especially in the later rounds. I would wary them to take an edge rusher within the first two days. So going into day three and grabbing this high upside athlete who Maybe could potentially put something together if you can coach him up, but at least at the meantime, you're getting a big-bodied run defender who can use his athleticism to affect the run game and get like maybe like three to five sacks a season. So, I mean, a good rotational guy. and Like I said, somebody to replace Boogie Basham or Shaq Lawson or just fill out that depth that you currently don't really have signed long-term. Sticking with that same mindset, let's go to sixth-round pick edge rusher DJ Johnson, a converted tight end to edge rusher who didn't really have a lot of production in his college career and was kind of overlooked by that Oregon defense because they had prospects such as Noah, Noah Sewell who was coming out that I thought about putting on this tier list somewhere, but I ended up just abstaining from that because I thought I had enough linebacker representation. But a big-time uh, athlete, like I said, it converted from tight end and then never really like got noticed at Oregon. So... Uh, this regime has shown that they like these guys who are kind of these switch athletes. Greg Rousseau was a former wide receiver. There's some other guys that I'm going to talk about that were former offensive players or highly skilled uh, position players who bulked up and moved down and have that upside because they're relatively new to the position. So I, I think this is going to be someone they would take a look at. He only really had one year of starting experience. Like I said, he was a late transfer to the edge rusher position and just fits the mold of a guy that can be that late developmental pass rusher. Um, for a team that maybe wants to take a day, like a late day three flyer and a guy to try to re replace some of those guys you're going to be losing in free agency. Like I said, with AJ Vanessa, but you bash him. I prefer Zach Harrison, but if you miss out on him, taking DJ Johnson to develop is not the worst thing you could do here. So uh, he's just one of the guys I'm higher on when it comes to these late round edge rusher uh, prospects. Next up is going to be the topic of my video from yesterday where I talked about uh, Clark Phillips III and how I'm a little lower on him than the common consensus is. I don't think he's a top 10 corner. I have him graded as a fifth round guy, which is why I have him here on this day three flyer bucket. But with Clark Phillips, most people see the issue as him being smaller, and that's why he's going to fall off for them. I really don't see that as his biggest issue. The biggest issue for me is going to be the fact that he's not a good man corner. Like his change of direction isn't the best. It's not consistent at the very least. And he just is really lost when it comes to the mental side of it. When it comes to man, he's a little stiff. So where he needs to go is to be probably a slot corner in a zone-heavy system, especially where he's able to play in those hook curl zones and the flats where he can read the triangle between the quarterback's eyes, the receiver, and himself, and then jump routes with good anticipation and good speed. I think he'll be set up for really good success in the Bills system. You could bring him in, have him play in that defense. Teron Johnson has been shown to be injury-prone, and right now, like, Saran Neal is your backup slot corner. I think, and maybe even if, like, you want to move... Uh, Dane Jackson in the slot corner, that could be good, but he's shown to be able to play on the outside. So if you want a replacement for Tron Johnson later down the road as like a cost-saving measure, or just a guy who can step in when Johnson's uh, injured, which has happened pre in a lot of his seasons previously, uh, I think Clark Phillips would be not a bad way to look with your fifth-round pick there. So that is going to round out our day three flyers, and let's move on to 
the day two to fill holes section. First up is going to be Ventrell Miller, linebacker out of Florida. Somebody who I talked about in my linebackers podcast that came out a couple days ago. Uh, really solid player. I really like what he does when it comes to stacking, shutting in the run game, dropping into hook girl zones, uh, being a leader, being a captain, especially for your linebacker room. And with the Bills not having a solidified answer in middle linebacker and having just brought AJ Klein in to be like that kind of mentor, captain guy in the linebacker room, it seems like they need somebody who can be like a mic guy and who can lead that room uh, captain wise or attitude wise. And even though Ventura Miller isn't this great athlete, He's going to be a plug-and-play starter at middle linebacker, and even if it's a replacement level starter, I think he could come in as a rookie and play for you in the middle of the field. And if he, even if you draft a guy in the first round, and you want to take a backup or somebody who you think, if even if it falls like maybe the fourth round, I would definitely snag him there. But if you need a position like a backup Mike linebacker to take over in case any injuries happen, like we saw, we had Terrell Bernard and. Uh, Dodson take over for some starting linebacker reps past two seasons when we had injuries in the linebacker core. I think Ventra Miller is like the staple of the overqualified backup linebacker who maybe isn't a great starter, but like you're super confident that he can come in and play for two, three, four games and be a good starter for you in that short term uh, where you can really hide his athleticism until your starter is healthy again. So it's just like a safety blanket for your linebackers or if all the other linebackers you really like get targeted and take taken on the first or early dirt day two and day one you could probably you know pivot to Ventron miller and it'd still be a really good pick for you next up is gonna be another third round guy for me and it's gonna be brandon joseph the safety out of notre dame formerly out of northwestern he was talked about last year as maybe potentially being a top 10 pick heading into the year and then throughout the 2021 season he kind of took a step back transferred over to notre dame and continued to show flashes of good athleticism and the ability to play in that split safety coverage system that the Bills like to run. So we've seen this past year with the whole Jordan Poirier and Micah, pa- Micah Hyde thing. Tamar Hamlin, now he's good to go play football again, but who knows if he'll be the same kind of player. And Jaquan Johnson is not being really ready to be a starter. Bringing in a guy like Brandon Joseph, who maybe needs more time to learn on perfecting his tackling form and just getting more seasoned by and coached up by, your, by a team that runs a system that really succeeds with him, I think... Once you're ready to move on from player or hide or they retire, you could put Brandon Joseph in and he'd be that guy who you draft in the like date in round three to be that eventual per, uh, taking over of a starter. So uh, I think it'd just be an upgrade over to Quan Johnson and probably DeMar Hamlin at the very moment and just would be a good idea to bring in and that way you can get him in your system, coach him up and really perfect what you want him want as a safety because he already showed flashes of doing that already. And if you can get him in your system and coach him up, before he's out there and gets fed to the flames and loses his confidence, then that'll be a good uh, procession plan when it comes to your safety duo when inevitably one or both of them are gone. Next up is going to be wide receiver Tank Dell out of Houston. I have him as a third round grade. He's probably one of the best route runners in his draft class, and he's got some good downfield speed, even though I would have liked to see it a little bit more. It didn't look like he was blowing anybody away against some lower competition. However, uh, I am still pretty high on him when it comes to what he could do. Some people have him because of his lack of size. He's only like 160 pounds or something like that. Uh, down in like the fifth, sixth round area, I have him as a third round pick just because his route running and use of speed in his routes and run after catch ability is so good that this could be the guy you thought Isaiah McKenzie could be. He'll be more of that traditional route runner while still providing some of that you know firecracker out of the slot and ability to make plays after the catch and use them in the jet sweep game. It'll just be more of a prototypical receiver than Isaiah McKenzie was. And you could really get away with running him in your slot right away, especially if uh, Khalil Shakir isn't ready. So I think he's an upgrade over Khalil Shakir right now. He's probably what the Bills were looking for initially in Isaiah McKenzie when it was looking like he was going to be the starting slot at the beginning of this past offseason. And it's just some guy who's been rumored to go to the Bills for a while and I think could be the answer to their slot issues. Next up is going to be Riley Moss, cornerback out of Iowa. Now, I know you just drafted a corner in the first round last year, and as well as your sixth round pick from last year still looked good at playing corner as well for you on the outside. But if the Bills want to just continue to fill out that room, maybe worried about a little bit of injuries with Tredavious White, perhaps not bouncing back to full form, I could see them going with Riley Moss, who's going to be a really true zone outside corner and is a good athlete, really has good speed, and knows how to squeeze routes in zones. And I think with his hip stiffness, you'd probably want him to play more in zone than man. I was a little higher on him prior. I think he's going to be a late round two, early round three guy. And I don't know how much 
corner, like outside corner is a need for the Bills. But if they do feel like they need to add to that room or push Kyrie Elam to be better, they could add another youthful guy, especially if they're planning on moving on from Tredavious White for cap reasons, especially if he can't rebound from his injury. So Riley Moss, if they're looking for that outside zone corner backup or eventual starter, I think Riley Moss would be a good fit for them in the second round. Maybe even the early third if you can snag him there. Just so that way they have insurance if that's what they're looking for. I can't really tell if that's what they're going to go for. I wouldn't be surprised if they drafted no corners in this draft class. But if they were going to look for an outside corner, this is the one I'd probably suggest. And where I'd probably say they would look for one, especially with how good this corner class is. Next up, going back to wide receivers and somebody I'm higher on. And another player I've made a full film breakdown on. It's going to be A.T. Perry, the wide receiver out of Wake Forest. Uh, somebody that really uses their size well. I think they're a good down through, downfield threat. Um, despite being a little bit taller and high-hipped. Uh, I'm really excited to see where he lands. I think he could be kind of that DK Metcalf-style player who just is big and can run vertically in a straight line. Maybe not the best change of direction or with the ball in their hands after the catch, but fills that role of a deep threat and adds size to your room. So, uh, Whereas a guy like this in the past, like a Hakeem Butler, has failed, I think Perry's a little more filled out. He has a better release in Hakeem and can get separation by working back down the stem as well as just beating guys over the top. Uh, and because he has that good downfield speed, he gets a lot of cushion, especially in college. And I think he's able to utilize that and work off that real well. Plus, he's a really good uh, blocker when he wants to be. And you just need to coach him up to be more of that. So they don't have an immediate need for a guy like this on their offense. But if they want to bring him in and do the clear Shakir, Khalil Shakir plan where they coach him on how to block and be a more consistent blocker, really have him buy in, uh, this could be a guy that takes over for Gabe Davis later down the road as your much bigger bodied option on that offense second to last guy in this tier and this one's going to kind of surprise some people because he's being floated as like a first round pick potentially for the bills and i kind of think this is where they're going to go with their first and it's jack campbell a linebacker out of iowa uh go check out my linebacker podcast if you really want to see what i really uh in depth feel about jack campbell i have a whole rant on him in there because i think he's elite when it comes to run defense and st- you know stacking and shedding blowing up plays, taking on pullers and lead blockers and things like that. He's going to improve your interior run defense immediately. Day one, your run defense gets better, and that's what they need. But at the same time, he doesn't really offer anything else outside of that. No blitzing potential, isn't really that great in coverage. The best thing he can do in coverage is just use his length to take away throwing lanes in the middle of the field. I wouldn't expect him to match up with some tight ends and man coverage or running backs out the backfield. And I really think that the Bills value that length in coverage. However... Uh, they he doesn't really offer much outside of that, whereas Tremaine Edmonds was at least a good enough athlete to go out and run with guys down the field. That's just not who Jack Campbell is. So if the Bills want to just fix their run game, run defense almost immediately with Jack Campbell, then they'll get that. And if they don't really care for their middle linebacker to be this kind of roaming coverage guy on top of that as well and just want some long scarecrow out on the pass defense, then Jack Campbell's their guy. But uh, if you're taking him in the early day two, I'd be fine with that. Round one's a bit rich for me, but that's where I stand with him. I do see the positives of taking a guy like this for the Bills, so I wouldn't be too mad if they did reach, but this is where I think he would be best taken in day two, and it would really fill a hole there, so I understand. And finally, one of my biggest my guys, and we're turning back to the wide receiver well here, and it's going to be Xavier Hutchinson, wide receiver out of Iowa State. I saw a really good comp for him from somebody I follow on Instagram saying he's kind of like a Michael Gallup where they don't excel anything. He's not elite when it comes to speed or route running or playing or you know jump ball situations or hands or anything like that but they're just jack of all trades good at everything he's not the best runner for the catch but he's still good he's a really good route runner not elite he's elite at changing his body and really adjusting to the catch especially making these falling down catches and really spectacular looking catches on the sidelines so i think as somebody who josh allen in the past has shown to be a little bit inaccurate uh, I think he could come in and take over for that. He's not like this deep threat, but neither is a guy like Gabe Davis who isn't like, like he can make plays downfield, but he's not like the fastest guy. And I really think Xavier Hutchinson could take over for that Gabe Davis role. They're almost the same exact size. And I think their skill set's pretty similar. And I think Hutchinson is more closer to Gabe Davis currently than Gabe Davis was when he was coming out of the draft. So to draft Xavier Hutchinson, maybe with Gabe Davis continues to struggle this year, move off him during the season or just bring him in have him learn from Gabe and then take over for that role next year when you don't want to pay him $20 million if he does continue uh, progressing as we think he will. So this is probably my favorite second round pick for them to go just because I'm a really big Xavier Hutchinson guy. 
and it fills a need, especially with Gabe Davis most likely being gone next season. Here we go with first round gambles, and this first guy I'm going to talk about, I don't really think offensive tackle is a big need, but I've seen a lot of people mocking this position to them. And you know what? Adding more offensive line help is always a need, and I've already created a whole video breakdown of this guy, so if you want to check out my play-by-play -play breakdown of his film, go check that out if you'd like. But DeJuan Jones, offensive tackle Ohio State, is just a beast, and if you want to improve your running game and really just give a guy who can pave roads for whoever you draft at running back or whoever you have starting, whether that's James Cook, Damian Harris, or someone else, uh, that's really the play here. And they don't need to really worry about these taller offensive linemen, as Josh Allen is one of the taller quarterbacks that can see over these guys. I don't really think Dewan Jones can move into guard, but if he's a natural right tackle, if you put him there, maybe you could move Spencer Brown into right guard or some like you know have a competition with him on an interior lineman. Just having a better combination and more variables to move around on that line to really make it work. So uh, I'm not a big fan of taking offensive tackle, but if you are going to do it in the first round, I would take Dewan Jones and just improve your running game immediately, and especially at the right tackle position where I think you'll be a better day one starter than Spencer Brown was, and even maybe if Spencer Brown doesn't progress, he might be a better starter right now than Spencer Brown is. So we'll see where that goes, but Dewan Jones is just a beast, and go check out my video breakdown of him if you want to hear more about that. Another first-round gamble, and it's a gamble because I don't think he's ready to like be an elite guy right now. He has definitely has the potential, and I think it's in a position of need for the Bills. I have him as a high round two just because of that, but I could definitely be okay with uh, drafting him at the end of the first round, more so than Jack Campbell. It's going to be Drew Sanders, linebacker out of Arkansas. A converted edge rusher from Alabama. Went to Arkansas. Really showed off that athleticism and blitzing ability, uh, as well as his block shedding and play side run defense. All that stuff you like from, like, he was showed up from his edge rushing days. Comes in. He's a really good IQ, athlete, good run defender, everything at linebacker. The only issues you have with him is going to be his a little bit iffy in pass coverage, and that's going to be better with more time, but... As we talked about, he's tall, 6'4", 6'5", can just get his arms in the way of passes, and is athletic enough to even go out and cover guys, so he could be like pretty much a Tremaine Edmonds fit. I think his comp is probably like, if you like, his high-end comp is Tremaine Edmonds, so if you're looking to replace that guy one-for-one, one, you could go Drew Sanders, and his other issue is going to be his just failure to wrap up and tackle consistently, so that's a really easily coached, coached up. I think it's going to be a problem for him year one, but moving forward, and this is going to be a projected guy, you want to fill in Jermaine Edmonds' spot and have not that much of a drop-off when it comes to uh, pass defense, maybe even get better at defending the run and rushing the passer from a linebacker, uh, and still having some of those question marks that Jermaine had as a tackler. Drew Sanders is basically like a plug-and-play replacement, and even if he's not to the level Tremaine was when he left here, he will be soon enough. So I trust our coaching staff to mold him, and this is going to be the one guy I'd be okay with them reaching for out of linebacker core that maybe I'm not on with the first round stuff. If you want to hear me talk about Drew Sanders more, check out the podcast. Let's move on to the next guy. Next up is going to be Kalijah Cansey, defensive tackle from Pitt. Just a one-to-one -one at Oliver replacement. He's actually a little shorter armed, and I don't know if I'd be really happy if we took him here, but we do need some more guys on the defensive tackle room. We have not nobody, I think, under contract for next year, and if they're really thinking about moving on from at Oliver, maybe getting Kalijah Cansey in and having the opportunity to slowly progress him on like what they what they couldn't do with Ed Oliver when they first drafted him, especially with less pressure of not being a top ten pick and learning from a guy like Ed who plays the way Kansas going to have to play at the next level, maybe they could get a better version of Ed Oliver without having to pay him at least immediately. So not my favorite of pick of the group, which is why he's in the gamble section, because that size profile has not shown to be successful consistently at the NFL level, but I can see why they'd want to take him there, and I still think it is a position of need to target, which is interior defensive line, and there's not a lot of those that go around every draft year, especially not this one where it's kind of light. And finally, my first round gamble section at the end of it is going to be Cody Mock, guard out of North Dakota State. I'm actually higher on him than most people are. I have him as a first round guy, and I think his transition from tackle to guard really shows how much of a good athlete he can be. And at the Senior Bowl, while not like excelling at anything, he showed that the stuff that you saw on tape at North Dakota State transferred and really worked well against guys from SEC and Big Ten and things like that. He was able to hold up against larger competition. Really good move blocker. Something that the Bills like to do is have moving pockets with roll, design rollouts, do some zone running, but also is just a tenacious blocker. Like He's not the strongest, not the biggest guy, but he'll get into guys and be willing to go up to the second level and bury some linebackers and just put his all into blocking. So if you want to run some of those more power schemes, even though he isn't the traditional size of like a power 
gap scheme guard, he'll still be able to go out there and perform some of those things. So I'm higher on Cody Mock the most, and I think if the Bills really want to improve their guard positioning over Connor McGovern or even uh, Ryan Bates, they could go Mock and then just see who wins that camp battle. And when those two guys, uh, those two entrenched starters' contracts are up, they can move Mock into the starting guard or even get him into the starting center role and be a replacement for uh, Mitch Morse down the road because they had Mock try out snapping for the first time in his life at the Senior Bowl. And if you had got a whole year of him riding the bench and being ready to take over, you could really teach him up how to snap. And when Morse inevitably gets another concussion or gets hurt during the season, have him step in and take over and see what he can do as your starting center. So there's a lot of positional versatility there. Uh, he is a smaller school guy, and he's not an immediate you know, plug-and-play starter for you because you have some entrenched starters already there for your guard and center. But I think Cody Mock, again, I'm higher on him, I think would be a good player to build up in your ranks and eventually take over for a cheaper option on your interior offensive line, which was already a place that needed improvement. And I don't really don't know if Connor McGovern moves the needle as much as a guy like Cody Mock would if he hits his ceiling. Our final two here is going to be first-round home runs. I think these are all guys that have true first-round grades for me and that if the Bills landed them, I'd be over the moon ecstatic for it. And it's going to get from realistic down to probably less realistic as we get through the rest of these guys. So let's start at the top, which I think is the most realistic when it comes to being available at their pick. Probably not what the Bills are really looking for, but I am in love with this player. It's going to be Dion Henley, the linebacker out of Washington State. A transition from wide receiver to DB to linebacker after and then trans- transferred from Nevada to Washington State. And with an uptick in difficulty level from playing from Nevada to Washington State, now moving to the Pac-12, looked great. And is still relatively new to the position that some of the Bills brass loves. And he's a good blend of what a modern-day NFL linebacker is supposed to be. He can cover the pass, is tenacious enough to defend against the run. He's a little bit undersized, but that's where the kind of linebacker is moving to, so they might stay away. But he is a great athlete, really isn't afraid to attack the run and be aggressive, is good in pass defense, has good athletic genes in the open field when it comes to his previous role as a wide receiver. So uh, you can see that on tape all the way and just need some more time to get more reps and get mentally ready. That's why I don't have him as like a high first guy. He's more of a back half of the first round grade, but it's just because inexperience has shown up a little bit on tape when it comes to like late, the play diagnostic diagnostic is late to click and trigger. But I think with more uh, play time and good coaching, which the Bills have, they'll be able to get the best out of him. So this is my favorite guy, and I think despite being an older older player, he has more upside just because of that late position switch. And I'm really in love with Diane Henley. I can't keep saying enough. Go check out my linebacker podcast. I go into all these guys super deep, and uh, Diane Henley is definitely the one I uh, talk about probably the most passionately. Going back to the wide receiver well, I'm going to go Jordan Addison, wide receiver out of USC here. I wanted to put Jackson Smith and Jigba, but I really don't think there's any realistic way he falls to us at 27. Uh, unless you want to move up, I think Jordan Addison is the one that will present himself to be there, and especially if there's a fall on receivers, and that I think would probably be the best fit. Right now you have Stefan Diggs, Gabe Davis. There's potential to talk about trading for DeAndre Hopkins. You just don't have that kind of slot receiver, and Jordan Addison with his route running and deep threat ability, he'll be like the actual true deep threat on this team. I think he just provides something to the wide receiver room that you don't really have outside of like Diggs, but Diggs is going to be blanketed by the, best, the team's best corner. If you can get Addison out there and really be a threat out of the slot that you just didn't have last year, I think it'll add a whole different dimension to the offense. And eventually, when if Diggs ever leaves or if you need to find a guy to come in and take over if he gets hurt, God forbid, uh, I think Addison is good enough with his release and his route running on the outside that he should be able to take over for that, at least in the short term. I do have a little bit of an issue of him dealing with contact, uh, especially if he isn't able to get a clean release. He's facing against a good jam uh corner but that's why i think he should start out in the slot as you coach him up i think he's good enough in the slot to do that and i think he does have the upside to be able to be a good outside wide receiver if he can get some of those technical things down with the athlete and or athleticism and route running he has shown previously up next is mozzie smith the defensive tackle out of michigan dude is just built like the incredible hulk and as a team who struggled to really find that nose tackle for this defensive front they brought in star luth lele Draw Harrison Phillips. He's had some success with Daquan Jones, uh, and they brought him back. But he's again, he's only on a one-year deal. And I think Mozzie Smith is one of those guys who's just built right. Whereas other nose tackles really succeed just from being massive and taking up space like that way. Mozzie Smith is just rocked up. He's super muscular, and he's able to just move guys. And if he's not double teamed, he's absolutely bowling 
uh, interior lineman back into the quarterback's pocket. And he's not getting these great sack numbers, but he's really applying pressure from up the middle and forcing quarterbacks to bounce it outside where you have better guys like Vaughn Miller and Greg Rousseau who can get those sacks. And that may also help out with Ed Oliver, getting him to, to not see as many double teams as well as some of the younger edge rushes you have like AJ Panessa. Really get to see that uptick in production if you've got a difference maker and a number changer like Mozzie Smith is. So I'm super high on Mozzie. I'd be super happy if they grab him at the end of the back half of the first round. I have a feeling he might not be there with the Chargers and Seahawks in front of them, who also have needs there. But Mozzie Smith could be that guy that this uh, Bills coaching staff has always dreamed of being there for their nose tackle. And he is one of those guys who's built right and built so well muscular wise. I think he has a lot more room to grow as a pass rusher in use of his hand techniques than a guy who's just a good nose tackle because he's large. Final two guys here. First up is going to be Brian Branch, the safety out of Alabama. Played a lot of slot corner at Alabama, and I know slot corner is like a specifically big need or safety because you brought back Poyer. But Brian Branch is like the only true like first-round safety in this class, and he's really a difference maker when it comes to either slot corner or like a split safety. And I think that maybe if Teron Johnson gets hurt, or you have a situation where you, when your safety gets hurt, we saw a depletion of our secondary this past year. You have a guy like Brian Branch who's going to rotate in as a rotational corner or as a backup safety. You're really not losing a step. Maybe you get even better if you, when he does come in. So it never hurts to get more DBs. I really think this is probably the biggest reach because there's not an immediate need for him with how many people you resigned. But with the age and injury history of your secondary, it would never hurt to bring a guy like Brian Branch who will be that eventual probably next in line to be a Pro Bowl safety for this defense who has produced two Pro Bowl safeties for the past five, six years and Hyde and Poyer who are getting long in the tooth at this point. And finally, this one's going to be the least amount of talking because it's B. John Robinson. There's a potential he will be there. He's probably the only player on this list I'm willing to trade up to get. And yes, you brought in Damian Harris to be that power back to compliment James Cook, but neither of those guys are preventing me from drafting a generational running back talent the guy who's being comped to Saquon Barkley and Adrian Peterson and stuff like that. So, yeah, it improves your offense and gives you a dimension that Josh Allen has never had in his career while being the starting quarterback for the Buffalo Bills. He had the tail end of Shady, and then he had the Devin Singletary years, and now they're taking on this new committee role with, with Harris and Cook. And I just think Robinson is that bell cow guy, that Saquon Barkley type, that he just makes the game easier for your quarterback because they're going to have to deal with him even if you're not – in a specific running formation, he still has the potential to break it big and score in every play. So uh, just really makes it easier in a quarterback, changes up numbers, makes the coverage have to think twice about the running, can open up a lot of play action and RPO stuff. Imagine them on the read option with Allen and Bijan. That would be insane. You're just taking a defender away from tackling Bijan because they have to stay home against Allen or vice versa. It'll just, it would be crazy. And this is the one guy I think I would trade up for, maybe JSN, but definitely Bijan Robinson. So. That is all 21 players I think would fit the bills that I have personally scouted. Uh, this is going to be a longer one, but I'm hoping that it's a bigger hit than the one last year was. I'm going to put a little more effort into this one, covered a lot more guys. And yeah, just give me your opinion of who I left off and who you think, who you want the Buffalo Bills to draft and with all their picks. So other than that, I'll see you guys in the next one.